I'm Rosie Vance. Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. What is the source of emissions larger than deforestation, larger than aviation and shipping combined, in fact, equal in size to the whole world's livestock and manure? And from this source of emissions, we get absolutely nothing useful from it. It's this slice of the global greenhouse gas emissions pie, fugitive emissions from energy production. The majority of that is from oil and gas, methane and carbon dioxide that is vented, flared or leaked from oil and gas exploration. And it's simply wasted. This segment didn't come from anyone getting French cheese shipped to Australia. No one visited their family on another continent. All we got is methane and CO2 in the atmosphere without any energy being generated at all. If you never realised the scale of this emission source, or if you maybe find it totally implausible that nearly 6% of the world's emissions are just wasted and no one ever really even talks about it, then welcome to the club because that's where I was until a couple of months ago when I got introduced to Mark Davis, who is the CEO at Capterio, a company that monitors gas flares using satellite data and then works with companies to find alternatives to flaring. So I talked to him and his colleague John Henry Charles about what is gas flaring, why it happens even after 73% of the world's oil and gas producing countries have agreed to end it. And in particular, I wanted to know if there's anything we can do about the situation. So let's take a look at the call I did with Mark and John Henry now, and we'll start with when and why does gas flaring occur during oil and gas extraction? Well, you see a graph published here by the Oil and Gas Authority that sort of segments flaring into three categories, A, B, and C. Um, and C is basically sort of flaring by necessity. Um, so this is sort of safety related um, gas flaring. So a, a pilot flare related to basically safety or emergency shutdown and, and, and blow down gas flares, which may be required from a process perspective. That's category C. Then you've got category A, um, which is potentially continuous flares. So this is the type of flaring that is, is solvable. This is a steady base load of, of continuous flaring, which may be the case because there is not offtake capacity. There's not a pipeline or a power generation unit that is using that gas. There's no market for it. So operators are choosing to burn the gas. And this, this category is the one which all operators and, and regulators should be trying to, to reduce because this is the sort of routine continuous base load, which, which is a volume of gas that is usable. And then you have category B, which is basically around off-spec gas. Um, and again, another sort of process related um, flare gas volume, which is process emissions related around the, the process. But critically here, it's category A, which is the one which is continuous, routine and solvable. So since the, the Paris Agreement in 2015, um, we've basically seen no progress in terms of gas flaring reduction around the world. And then there's a second element of this picture, which is probably more concerning which is that flaring intensity, so that's the volume of gas burnt per barrel of oil produced, has actually actually been tracking upwards. Um, so moving upwards from 2017 through till 2020, it's on a four year upwards trend, meaning we're burning more gas per barrel of oil produced, which means that in 2021, as oil production rebounds following COVID, it's quite likely that we're actually gonna see the most flaring ever. Um, in 2021, in the decade of climate action, will be as far away from um, zero routine flaring as has has been the case in, in the history. So we're manifestly yeah. off track, and, and change needs to needs to come. So this data shows that the problem of flaring is getting worse, not better, which means that overall the oil and gas supply chain is getting dirtier, not cleaner. And yet I've seen recently these announcements of carbon neutral LNG projects. How can that be? So let's ask Mark what he thinks of carbon neutral LNG, starting with an explanation of what it is exactly. There's a, a real um, growth in so-called carbon neutral liquefied natural gas. Where the, off, where the emissions through the life cycle are, are said to be offset by, uh, for example, uh, renewables projects or um, uh, capture projects, including, for example, planting trees. But the real challenge that we face is that, and we actually looked into this, we wrote a paper on, on flaring within the LNG supply chain. The real challenge we, we've noticed is some of the projects that have so-called carbon neutral LNG uh, being delivered from them also happen to be flaring significantly. 
And I don't know precisely what calculations underpin their carbon neutrality, but the question I would be asking is, are, are, are these operators fully accounting for the emissions? Do they fully know and uh, uh, account for, uh, in a robust way, the emissions throughout the supply chain, not only of, uh, of, uh, of flaring, um, but also of methane through uh, methane leaking and venting. And that's, that's the open question. Until we have full disclosure by companies on you know, their accounting and their methodologies, it will be rather much of a black box. So transparency is super key um, and holding, yeah, holding entities to account who yeah, make, make claims around carbon neutrality is, is, is an important thing. Um, and, and that was one of the drivers behind Flare Intel and developing Flare Intel is to bring a bit more transparency, bring a bit more accountability um, to this landscape and yeah, bring, bring awareness and bring action through data um, to, t to tackle the problem. So in the sort of oil and gas emissions monitoring space using satellite data ecosystem, um, there are sort of two, I guess, core emissions that, that satellites are looking at. One is methane, um, and then the other is sort of flaring, combustion, thermal anomalies. Um, in the methane landscape, you have Sentinel-5P, you have methane sat, GHG sat, which are all looking at, at methane. They're detecting methane through sort of hyperspectral work. And what Flare Intel uses is, is VIRS data. Um, so this is visual infrared spectrum data. What VIRS really is doing is, is detecting the thermal anomaly, the heat anomaly associated with the combustion of stuff. But we, we use it in the context of detecting thermal anomalies associated with oil and gas fields. And then that thermal anomaly is computed into a, a volume of flaring gas. And that is the number that we use for the basis uh, that underpins our work. Um, in, in terms of what we're ultimately doing, we're basically working with Colorado School Mines, Nightfire algorithm, and that, that's up one viz related data set um we're processing that data set um we're basically converting and making estimates of, of flare volumes around the world um we're associating those estimates with operators so with equity information um so we know exactly who is associated with the flare um and then we're underpinning it all with visual imagery um to provide this exciting sort of dynamic experience where you can check who is flaring what and where. So this is the Flare Intel tool. Um, and what you see is pretty simple. Number one, you see in the center of the screen, basically a map with a bunch of dots. And these dots indicate where gas flares are. And the size and the color indicates severity or the size of the gas flare. So here you see then the gas flare, you see it's the visual imagery associated with the flare, you see the black carbon coming off the flare and then the flame itself. Um, you see the here the gas volume being flared. Um, and then if that's an abstract figure, you can basically convert it to um, an emissions equivalent. So this flare is sort of it was 1 million tons of co2 equivalent in 2019 then you can say okay in terms of us passenger vehicles equivalent what is that this flare alone in 2019 generated emissions equivalent to 300,000 us passenger vehicles and on this i'm going to say the the you can look into our faqs on it but the emissions assumptions that we're inputting in here are pretty conservative um so it could be even worse, uh, particularly given the black smoke coming coming from the facility. I'm sure, the combustion efficiency is very low. So I guess there are there are sort of th three, and Mark can add, I'm sure, but three simple quote unquote solutions to to a flare like this. Say, one is obviously connecting it to a gas pipeline um, and taking it to a market if that pipeline has capacity. Um, another option is basically power generation. Often remote locations like this or remote fields, power generation is, 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 is being done through diesel, diesel burn. So they're burning diesel to generate the power. You could use this gas to displace that utilization of diesel 
and use the gas instead to generate the power um, for, for, for local consumption. Um, and then the third is sort of kind of more exotic solutions. In the US, there's, a, there's been a big development in the use of, of, of gas flares for um, essentially computing. Um, so for Bitcoin mining um, or basically using the gas to generate electricity, which you then create demand for through um, high power computing. So, so this is a view of, of Flare Intel Pro. So you see the gas pipelines, you see the concession boundaries, you see the accumulations. So you, you begin to, to get those flares in context. And, and then beneath the map view, you then basically see the daily profile of, of daily flare volume through time. Um, so that's the time series that you see beneath the map. There, the blue bars indicate gas flare volumes. Um, estimated by by us at Flare Intel, and then the red dots indicate the the temperature, um, and that's the temperature of the flare. So, just to give you some examples, there are actually quite a few flare capture projects that have been done that have been proven to be successful. What you're seeing with the the graphic is the is the data from Flare Intel Pro, where the blue bar is the volume of the flare, and you can see a significant shift in each of these profiles. But the top left one is a, a project in Egypt where the company uh, captured the gas and put it into a nearby gas pipeline. And you can see from July 2019, a really significant reduction in, in, in gas flowing from that point. Yes, there were a couple of blips uh, later on in, in the year. You can see their operational issues. But for the most part, this is a very successful project. Uh, the top right project is an example in Egypt where actually the operator did what we mentioned earlier. They, uh, they captured the gas and they used it to generate power. And in doing so, they reduced their use of diesel, therefore also reducing emissions of a, a, from a, a high carbon fuel. So what we are basically arguing is that by bringing uh, the data to life with Flare Intel and Flare Intel Pro, we can really drive the focus on gas flaring, increase the focus on gas flaring. We can begin to hold companies and groups to account, but we can also, and it's, you know, uh, it's a gift to the world that in a sense we've given, we can also for free enable companies to identify investment opportunities. And, you know, if that means that we get more activity in this space and then we get more reduction in emissions, and we accelerate the energy transition, that, that's a huge win for the operators, the investors, the governments, the people uh, of, of those countries and for the world at large. Wow. I'm still kind of reeling from the new knowledge that there is such a large volume of greenhouse gas emissions from flaring. And I want to reiterate that the figures we talked about in this video are likely to be underestimates. That's because flares don't burn all the methane that comes out. Some escapes, and because methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2, there is a big difference in the greenhouse gas effect of a 98% efficient flare compared to a 70% one. We did talk about that in more depth in this interview, along with other really interesting topics that unfortunately I had to cut here to get the video short enough. Like there was more on the kinds of solutions that are possible and whether we need to worry about increased attention on flaring potentially causing um, companies to switch to venting instead, which would of course be much more harmful. I actually make a long cut of all these interviews for my Engineering with Rosie Patreon community. So if you'd like to see the full interview and support the channel, then you can join us. I'll put a link in the description. You can also check out the Capteria website for more information on everything we talked about today, including more examples of projects where flaring has been reduced. I also wanted to add that when I first heard about the size of the flaring problem, I thought, well, you know, we're decarbonizing, we're not gonna be burning fossil fuels soon, so the problem will go away. But actually about 8% of today's fossil fuel usage will still be needed even in a net zero world for non-combustion purposes, like chemical feedstocks, lubricants, paraffin waxes, and asphalt. And if we ever get carbon capture working and start to rely on it on a significant scale, including maybe for blue hydrogen, well, then the amount is likely to be three or four times bigger than that. And of course, as we reduce the amount of fossil fuels used, it's gonna be the cheaper resources that continue to be exploited, which just so happen to be the ones that typically do the most flaring. So the problem isn't gonna go away on its own. One other thing that Mark and John Henry told me about was the huge range of flare intensity from different countries, depending on policy. 
the Norwegian, Dutch, Saudi and Canadian flare intensity is vastly less than the global average because they've had policies to support that for decades. So it's clearly possible to solve this problem and it just boggles my mind that while individuals are being encouraged to make personal sacrifices, like not flying cross-continental to visit my brother in Canada, or eating local instead of importing cheese from France, not that there's anything wrong with Australian cheese, it's actually really amazing, it's just that we don't have Roquefort. While we're shaming individuals for continuing these emitting behaviours, who's shaming oil and gas companies who continue to flare and to vent and fail to fix their leaks? Who's shaming the governments that continue to allow it? That's what I love about the Flare Intel tool. It gives you and me the information we need to be able to speak up about it. And next time you see a carbon neutral LNG project, you can check whether they've actually eliminated emissions from flaring or whether they just paid someone somewhere to not cut down a tree that they were maybe thinking about cutting down someday. I'll see you in the next video.